In the case for uh, public ledgers, uh, and I'm talking about ledgers, not so much blockchains, because a blockchain is just how you do things. But what you're really doing is you're building a ledger. So I, I, I prefer this word. And now, uh, speaking of uh, terminology in general, just to clarify things. So what we mean by a blockchain is a blockchain is a data structure. It's a thing, right? Uh, and what it can do is that it will give you a uh, cryptographic audit trail uh, for operations that have happened. So typically you have entries in a ledger and you take all these entries and you hash them together and you sign them to make sure that the entry is authorized. And then you have a one big data structure. And the nice thing about it is that it gives you a self audit. You know, you can look at this data structure and you know that um, you, you, you can verify the integrity of it. You know, it's not been, uh, it's not been tampered with. And the nice thing about a blockchain as well as a data structure is that it lends itself well to consensus algorithms. So consensus algorithms, they allow um, different parties, typically different computers uh, in different places to come to consensus, to have the same view over the same data structure. And they're typically, you know, they're not that easy, but if you try to build your consensus algorithm on top of a blockchain, it makes it a little easier to do, uh, to do this thing. It's, it's notoriously hard to build those. And so that's, uh, that's convenience. And um, so, and just to remark one thing, a blockchain is a data structure, so therefore it's a thing, it's not a process. So what, if someone ever tells you like, we're using blockchain, that, you know, that doesn't mean anything. So I, 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 you can replace it with, by vehicle. You know, we're using vehicle in order to, uh, to solve our problem. No, you're using a vehicle. Uh, and so what you build with that is you build a ledger. So a ledger is a collection of accounting entries. So, you know, people are building a little more than that with a blockchain, but morally it's pretty much what you are, what, what you're building. So you're, you're, you're building this, uh, um, this data set and you're using another data structure to show the integrity of your ledger, to show that it's not been tampered with and possibly to reconcile it against uh, many parties. So think of the blockchain as a tool you use to synchronize uh, the ledgers around many parties and to audit them. Um, and so replicated ledgers are not necessarily very new. Uh, so, you know, the principle of uh, accounting, for example, is that in accounting, you don't just take the amount of money you have in your bank account, and then when you make, uh, uh, when you make a withdrawal or when you spend something, you don't go uh, over there with a the rubber and erase the old amount and put in a new amount. You add a new line, uh, you know, in your, le in your ledger, and you say, okay, so I have, you know, a little less in this account, a little more in this account, and I've made a uh, spend. And if I go over the book, I have an audit trail of what happened. So it's nicer with a blockchain because you get to do uh, digital signatures. So you can see that, you know, maybe someone didn't like sneak in and wrote the wrong information, or at least if they did so, they had to get the key first. So that's a little harder for them. Uh, but you do have an audit trail uh, and you have the idea of having auditors and controllers uh, who can ensure that you have once, only one set of books because that's also the very important part. You know, it's a self-auditing data structure, but it doesn't mean that it's correct. It means that, you know, if you know, you know, the point of a blockchain is that if I give you the, you know, the tip of the blockchain, you can just follow it down and verify that, you know, just from a small amount of information, just from a hash, you can verify the entire history but you don't know that it's correct either. And typically, you know, if you look at um, the, the, the kind of schemes that people pull with accounting, in general, you have, you know, you, you could have two books, for example, your internal book, which is your real book, and the book you show your auditors or your book you show your investors. So, you know, that's, that's what you want to avoid. And uh, that's what you can do with, uh, by replicating the ledger and having many people look at it and confirm that, yes, you know, we all saw the same version of the ledger, you know, the, the accounts match up. Uh, then if you want to, you know, so that's old technology. If you want to do this in a digital realm, the amount of, you know, the, the, the technologies you need to do that are fairly old. Uh, SQL for building databases and databases are older than SQL, but even SQL is like 45 year old. Uh, it's closer to the discovery of penicillin than, we, than to current times. So if you're thinking of SQL, think of something that's kind of like as old as penicillin and not something that's as old as like, you know, newer uh, <laughs> fancy stuff. And uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, the paper uh, is, you know, the paper on the Byzantine generals is 39 year old. And there's like a lore in, uh, in the Bitcoin space, which is, you know, it's like, I mean, it's kind of dying now, but it was so popular around like 2013, 14. It was like, you know what? There was this Byzantine general problem that no one could solve. And finally, it's been solved. No, the paper that introduced a problem introduced a solution with it. There's a solution in the paper. So there are better solutions that came after, but still, you know, we've had solutions for a long time. Um, 
And so what's new exactly, if, if none of this is new, what, what is new? Uh, so I think what's really new in this space uh, is decentralized ledgers and permissionless platforms, because that's some things that we really didn't know how to do before, and that now, uh, now we can do. Uh, and so, okay, so before I'm going to go into why is it desirable, I'm going to define it a little bit. What do I mean by uh, decentralized ledgers and permissionless platform? So a decentralized ledger, as opposed to uh, merely a distributed ledger. In a distributed ledger, you would have many parties, and maybe those parties have the same view of the ledger, so maybe one of them uh, might be, uh, I don't know, you might be the CEO of the company, you want to see the book, you might have your auditor see the book, you might have someone else's the book, so you, you could distribute it to a few people, but here you really want uh, uh, it to be decentralized. So there's no, there's not going to be a single root of authority. It's like uh, it could be anyone in the world who could have um, the same view of the uh, of the ledger, and it should be permissionless in the sense that you know anyone can uh, anyone can access it, anyone can edit it at the same time, and that presents a unique challenge. And before I go into why this is hard, uh, let me explain why this is desirable to begin with. So the first thing you can do if you have um, this type of ledger is that you can build financial disintermediation. Uh, it's essentially what it means is you can do things like Bitcoin, for example, where you create a currency that can be spent across the world without intermediaries. Now, if you think about it, in the history of humanity, it's never been possible before to send value from uh, one continent to the other quickly and without intermediaries. Now, we knew how to do it slowly and dangerously. You know, you could put gold, for example, on a, uh, on a boat, and then you go and, uh, and you sail away to the other continent, and maybe there are pirates, and maybe you sink, so it's very dangerous and it's very slow. It's not a very good payment mechanism. Or you could do it through credit. So with credit, you would put it with a financial intermediary, and then there would be another financial intermediary on the other side, and then they maintain lines of credit, and once every year, they clear with each other by sending a large uh, galleon full of gold. It's not a very convenient system. So for the first time in history, because of decentralized ledgers, we have this ability of doing financial dis disintermediation. And it goes beyond payment. Uh, it could be things like insurance. It could be things like escrow. It could be a lot of financial services that can be dis disintermediated. And why is that good? Well, because intermediates can uh, extract rents, uh, especially uh, in spaces where they have large moats around, uh, around them. And so, you know, it can be expensive to use them. Um, there are also security holes, uh, and you know part of the reason why financial intermediation is so regulated is because, you know, if you are basically responsible for people's money, you're taking people's money, and you say, yeah, 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 I'm going to pay someone else, uh, you could have scammed with the money. So the possibility of fraud when you have intermediaries is very high, and as a result, by lowering this intermediation, you're lowering the risk of fraud, and you're lowering friction, and you're lowering cost. So that's that's interesting. Uh, another one is uh, censorship resistance. And so another thing that your intermediary can do is that it can prevent you from making your transaction. Uh, and intermediaries have been used, for example, in the US to chill otherwise perfectly legal activities. So there was this thing called Operation Choke Point, where the US government basically applied pressure to the banks to not give financial services to a bunch of businesses which were legal, but which they did not like. And that operation ended, but there was a big scandal around that. And so it is absolutely possible that it can be used as a tool of uh, soft power and kind of like extra legal control of uh, uh, of the economy, and that's that. You know, this is not this is not very nice. Uh, and uh, another one is privacy, and I would say that uh, here, uh, I would say a lot of um, a lot of the decentralized ledgers that exist today are not great in terms of privacy, but at least they offer potentially a road towards it with the possibility of privacy. And again, that's important because if you have to deal with an inf intermediary, then your intermediary is going to know everything about you, right? As opposed to just the other person that you're dealing with, now you have to have this third party who has all of this information about you. And you know, just because we have, our, our lives are more and more digital, it's not just you know, uh, finance, it's also um, you know, your pictures are going to be probably now on the cloud, all of your like personal information in the cloud. And just because we have this digital convenience doesn't mean that we should completely lose our privacy in the process. You know, just because we're moving towards electronic payments, I love, I love making contactless electronic payments with my phone, it's fantastic, but like, I also know that I lose a lot of privacy compared to just paying in cash. And so we, we, we should be able to have this convenience without losing a ton of privacy to intermediaries. So I think this is why it's desirable. And uh, another thing is that there's also evidence, you know, uh, it's not just uh, a pipe dream, there's evidence of permissionless platform, which have been extremely successful as, at bringing innovation uh, and at bringing progress. And so uh, a typical one would be the software and the internet. So software and the internet is largely permissionless. 
Uh, you can basically um, sell, you know, you can write software and start selling it uh, without any gatekeepers or any intermediaries. Likewise, you can uh, launch a website very, very easily. Um, you don't have, you know, it's not like, for example, AOL controls the internet. And if you want to start a new website, you have to go and convince AOL that you should be on their platform. It's free. Anyone can open a business. Anyone can open a website. And today you can see the result of that with the fact that the largest companies in the world are software companies and internet companies. And I don't think this is because, oh, software is so good and internet is so good. It's, this is not because it's so new or it's because there's so, so much value in it. I think fundamentally it's because it's permissionless and so it's been much easier for people to start these companies. Um, and uh, you know, other areas have stagnated in comparison. And uh, again, I, I don't think it's a hanging fruits type of situation. Uh, simple example is like, like, take a look at Netflix. So you can, Netflix is not really, not really about the technology, right? You know, they do need a fair amount of technology, like any company does. But really, they're in the business of showing you uh, movies and TV shows on your TV. And just a fraction of dealing with existing content providers meant that as a company, they had to move towards producing their own shows. You know, this is this is what it led to. There's just so much gatekeeping that their only path to survival was to say, well, I guess we can't, you know, we're asking for permission to put these shows here, but it's just like the friction is too high, the costs are too high, we just have to produce our own. So this is, um, this is a big impediment, I think, to progress and growth. Uh, if you look at uh, a period in the US uh, called the Gilded Age, around uh, 1870 to uh, 1900, it's one of the highest growth uh, period uh, in the world, at, at, at least for, uh, for for the Western world, and it was like four to five percent GDP growth a year. It's been enormous growth, and it's gro and, and it's you know you're thinking of this area, and because it's old, you don't necessarily think of it as, as technological innovation, but like you know the discovery of uh, extracting oil, extracting energy, uh, doing doing steel, uh, building skyscrapers, all of this is like crazy, wacky technological innovation, and at the time it's completely permissionless, and I think it's been a main driver uh, of uh, industrialization and, and wealth. So, okay, so this is desirable. Let's say we want to have these permissionless platforms. Why is, it, uh, why is it hard? Well, the first thing is that classical systems, like the BFT system we're talking about, they typically assume a root of authority. They assume that you have someone who's in charge and who says, OK, your permission and your permission and your permission. And that works really well with classical algorithms, which can tolerate some faulty uh, members, but overall assumes that you have some in this majority, and also assumes that you have out-of-band ways of enforcing rules. Essentially, if you find that a node is misbehaving or is sending bad information, then you go to them and you say, okay, you're doing something, you're doing something bad. If you're trying to do it at the scale of the internet on a permissionless system where anyone in the world can access a system and be anonymous, you do not have out-of-band enforcement mechanism. So you need to use in-band enforcement mechanisms for the security of your system. And the innovation that uh, public blockchains have made uh, is that they have used pecuniary incentives to do that. Uh, they use the emission of tokens uh, on proof of work uh, blockchain and the spending of energy uh, on proof of stake blockchain. They've used the idea of bonding. So you have all of this um, in-band mechanism for enforcing honesty, uh, which, which, which is not really a problem that you have when you're building a permission system. So that's... Um, that's a difficult one. The other one is, in order to have this uh, ability to be censorship resistant, you need to have a large, you need to have some decentralization, meaning that you shouldn't have a party which becomes so big that, it, that they can actually censor the network or control the network. And the problem is that economic incentives generally push towards centralization because centralization is cheaper. It's much cheaper to have someone who has the most expertise in doing something, you know, the person who, call, who runs a server for the cheapest, uh, the person who who has the most uh, expertise in doing something, they're going to end up, you know, they have the lowest cost, so they're going to end up doing all of this. And you see it even in decentralized systems like Bitcoin, for example, uh, most of the mining is going to happen wherever the electricity is the cheapest. So economic incentives are going to drive towards centralization, and keeping your system decentralized is basically an uphill battle. Um, there's also the problem that if no one is in charge, which is what you're trying to achieve, we don't want anyone in charge because the person in charge can extract rents. So we don't want that. And no one in charge can create a tragedy of the commons. Essentially, if no one is in charge, who takes care of the network? What happens is there's a problem. What happens if you know there's a, a new way of doing signatures and you can't actually uh, use that in your network? What we're trying to do with, uh, you know, with uh, Tezos, which is a, a project I've been heavily involved with for many years now, uh, is that 
you're trying to basically use governance mechanisms uh, in order to uh, make decisions about the network. So without having anyone explicitly in charge, you have a mechanism for uh, decentralized decision making. Uh, the other analogy I want to bring is that of uh, uh, rockets and other actuation. So uh, you can think of uh, many systems as being underactuated versus overactuated. So an overactuated system, you have many points of control. You can do whatever you want. So the human body, for example, is overactuated. You know, if I want to take my finger and I want to point here, you know, I can do it like this, or I can bring my body like this. So I have many muscles I could be moving moving in order to do the same movement. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have a rocket, which is a completely underactuated system. You basically have something that is just shooting a lot of fire at one end and has a pointy end at the other, and you're trying to basically put it in very, very precise orbits. And you have few ways of control it, so you have to do uh, dynamic forms of control. It's really difficult to control it. Same thing with a public blockchain. Once it's launched, once it's live, if you know it's kind of a rocket, you've sent it, and it's like, now you have to hope that it's going to go in orbit and it's not going to crash down to Earth. Because if there are problems, there's not someone who can come in and say, whoops, you know what, let's stop it. I'm going to uh, repair it, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's repaired. So the technological challenge of doing this is, uh, are pretty hard, and we've seen it uh, when catastrophic bugs happen on, uh, on, on, on blockchains. It can be really hard to, uh, it can be hard to recover and it's possible but it's it's definitely uh, something that people have in mind when they're looking at public ledgers as opposed to private ledgers uh, and so okay so I want to do a, a, a bit of a Q&A because you know I, I, I know what I know I don't know what you're interested in I don't know what you want to know about this presentation and so uh, I'll open it up now okay so what are your questions yes uh, that's completely irrelevant to the uh, topic today. Thank you for being an asshole. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. Is it working? Oh. Um, I'm interested to know more about the, the governance. Uh, so obviously we have this formalized governance process. Um, so many proposals can be put forward and people can vote on the proposals. Uh, but, um, oh, and then, sorry, and, the, and it, I'm thinking about the delegation and the fact that there's, there's fees for the delegation. Over time, I imagine that the fees would uh, kind of normalize. Mm -hmm. um, where, where do you see the kind of competitive element of the... Uh, the delegation uh, being in relationship to um, the representation of votes could could it potentially be related to um, a particular particular faction of the industry that maybe delegators would represent the interests of a particular industry or how how do you imagine that? Uh, so I'm not sure you're asking something about the fees of delegation and how yeah, that yeah. might affect so, representation. So I'm probably not uh, expressing it properly, but. Right. So um, w when you design a governance system, especially in public blockchains, you're going to have to deal with an issue, which is that uh, you don't, you know, not every participant is active at the same time. Uh, and there are participants which are time are going to be very active and are going to be very close to the network and others which are not going to be uh, necessarily paying attention all the time. And so if you have a naive voting system, for example, which asks everyone to just participate in a vote, you're going to have very low turnout. And it's been a problem for some uh, projects who try to have governance. And uh, the solution to that is essentially delegation. Uh, you're trying to say, okay, I'm going to uh, give my voice to someone else so that they can participate. Uh, and um, the difficulty with delegation, of course, is principal agent problems. So, you know, you, I, I know what I might want to vote, but how do I know that the person I delegate uh, to is going to make the right decision? Uh, so one aspect of that is trust. Maybe I know that person and maybe they're going to make a good decision, but that's not great. We want to rely on something a little stronger. Um, in Tezos, you have the benefits that anyone who is basically a delegate uh, is also creating blocks. As a result of creating blocks, they're bonded. And so uh, you do have, uh, the, 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 you know, in general, they're going to uh, tend towards making the same type of decision that you want, might want to make. But also the fact that the type of decision you're trying to make, um, you have very large thresholds. So you're trying to, um, you're, 
you're trying to make decisions which are not too controversial, essentially. You're trying to uh, make technical decisions for improving your ledgers. You know, the example I gave was, hey, you have a new signature algorithm, something of the sort, and things which can bring so much consensus, basically, that it doesn't really matter uh, at the end of the day uh, where you uh, where you delegated. The idea is that if the thing is bad, it will, you know, it will obviously fail, and, it was, and, it's, and if the thing is good, it can pass very, very large uh, threshold. I guess I'm pointing to... Uh Futarchy, I suppose, that potentially delegates would represent the interests of a part of the community. Do you imagine that we sure, evolve so into that? Futarchy as a, as a governance mechanism is the idea of running betting markets as a way of uh, determining, uh, trying to predict the effect. Of a, of a change of a, or, or a policy. And yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting way of, uh, of doing it. I strongly believe in uh, whenever you have governance procedures in adding them together. So the idea is that I think that um, proposals which are bad, like governance proposals which are bad, are typically going to uh, be bad in a few ways, but not in every ways. And so you might have a proposal that looks good, that, that might pass a vote, but that would not pass for Turkey. You would you could have a, a proposal that passes future key, but that's you know that has like a, a little hack in it that make, made it pass future key, but wouldn't pass a vote. However, it's hard for a good proposals to basically not be retained by by these different filters. So you're going to have a lot more uh, false. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of false negatives, which means that it's if you have filters, it's best to basically take the conjunction of all the filters you have, rather than a, a disjunction. Yes. in order to incentivize the government. The what? How, how do you figure out how much inflation or uh, other, otherwise how you create enough incentive yeah. in order to incentivize good governance? And how do you figure out how much is too much? So if you're thinking about the public chains, uh, one interesting aspect, uh, one interesting alternative to doing uh, governance about the technological change that you do to your chain is to say, well, ideally, we would be able to run multiple chains that would communicate with each other. Uh, and it was this idea that was pushed in Bitcoin uh, of doing side chains. And essentially, if you have side chains and you don't have this conundrum because you can say, well, I'll have a side chain that works this way and you have a side chain that works this way and then we'll just move assets from one to the other and then we don't have to agree on anything. And if you really take this idea really, really further, then the only thing you need governance over at the end of the day becomes issuance of tokens because that's the one thing that a side chain cannot do. Uh, it cannot issue more tokens than, uh, than the main one. So... And, but, but, but I think it's pretty central because issuance of token is how you guarantee the security of the networks. Issuance of token is how you can incentivize um, um, innovation, for example. So to answer your question, uh, it's, that's what the governance determines. I think it's, it's an important part of it. Hi, Arthur. Quick question about the current um, state of Tezos. Where are you at now? How far along is the project? Uh, so the Tezos project started around 2014. Um, it launched as a test net in uh, February of 2017. Then it became a beta net. Uh, so, you know, the beta net was a lot more concrete than a test net because the test net would reset often. So the beta net started in um, June of 2018. So just last year, uh, and then became a more stable mainnet around September of 2018. So the network has been running and is currently going through a first uh, voting procedure. And the voting procedure essentially means that uh, so there's a, uh, um, a software development company in Paris who proposed a change, and it's a minor change to the, uh, to the protocol. And that change has been injected, and there's been a vote on chain. And the participation was about 85% uh, so far. And so it's, a, it's a long process. It's about a three months process in order to uh, uh, um, basically ratify uh, this change, and we're through the last stretch of it right now. So you've already done something regarding governance and being able to change your protocol. That's what you're talking about now. Yes, yes. Uh, and how, in the long term, do you think you can um, make sure that there is engagement so that people continue to vote over the long term? Is there a mechanism that you have in place for that? Uh, so right now, I don't think that there's been a need for an in, uh, incentive for people to vote. People have been very happy to participate in voting in general because, you know, the cost of voting to them is extremely low. You know, you just send one comment. It's something that's going to happen at most some, like you know, a couple times, uh, like maybe a couple times a quarter. So it's very... Um, it's very limited involvement, but it has a lot of positive effects for the network. So there hasn't, you know, people have discussed the idea of, uh, hey, maybe voter, voters should be rewarded, but it, it hasn't felt very necessary so far. Right. Yes, sir.
you've gone through permissionless and uh, private uh, public blockchains. Do you think there's any uh, like room to talk about permissioned or private blockchains, especially in the context of R three quarter? Do you think it's just a buzzword? You know, because when I think of blockchain, I think of immutability and decentralization. Whereas when I think of a private blockchain, you know, it's, it's not immutable, it's, it's, it's not decentralized. So do you think that's just a buzzword that's being used by companies like R3 or IBM on the Hyperledger? Or, uh... So, so uh, there's several levels. First of all, I do, think, I, I, I do think there's a place for private blockchain. I do think they can be useful. If you go to the beginning of my presentation, uh, I think it basically uh, gets you better book reconciliation, it gets you better audits. So it improves on a lot of the existing system. So, you know, I don't think it's as revolutionary or as important as public blockchains, but, you know, it's definitely like has a place and is not meaningless. At the same time, it is also used as a buzzword. You know, does that mean that there's a lot of actors who are uh, like trying to put blockchain in every source? And of course, that and oftentimes it doesn't make sense. What's, what's the difference between a, a private blockchain and a consortium database apart from the word blockchain? Well, what's the problem with a consortium database? No, no, it's great. <laughs> it's been, because it's been not, it's, it's, you know, in practice, people have not run like really good consortium databases before, and uh, they have not been very, you know, they've not been very good at it. Uh, they didn't uh, leave clear. Uh, but you know what? I'm like, uh, I think uh, Richard is going to do a better job defending it than I than I would. It's like, uh, sorry, just one, one job, really, really quick question. <laughs> just interested to know your view on um, the likes of Coinbase offering delegation as a, a service. Yeah, is that is that a positive as far as you're concerned, or is it? negative? Uh, I think it's an empirical question. Overall, I think it's positive to have different uh, players of different size trying to uh, do this. It's really a heterogeneous environment. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like it's also inevitable. You know, it's like obviously uh, there are large custodians who are part of this ecosystem. And, you know, anytime you're going to have governance, this is, this is going to happen. So uh, at the end of the day, it's like even, you know, whether it's good or not, you, can't, you, have, to, you have to work with it, right? If, you don't, if, you, if your system cannot accommodate with that, then you have a bad governance uh, mechanism to begin with.